San Angeles regulars uh, are used to seeing Susie Spickle as the um, as our MC. She couldn't join us tonight, so um, I am filling in. I'm Brett Thielen with the Harris Center. I will. I am not the princess of poop, so I will not be talking scat tonight. You'll have to save your scat questions for the next time when Susie can join us. Um, but we do have lots of great questions tonight. So um, welcome all. Okay, Jenna, do you want to introduce yourself and tell us your expertise? Sure. Uh, my name is Jenna, and I am at work in the school programs. And my background is in entomology, so I tend to answer mostly insect questions. Karen Siever. Oh, I caught you mid chew. Sorry. Oh, it's that. all good. <laughs> I'm I'm uh I'm from Philly. I can talk with my mouth full quite easily. <laughs> um, so hi everybody, I'm Karen Siever and uh, at the Harris Center, I work as an ecologist and uh, I'm a bit of a generalist, but in this forum, I usually take some of the, uh, the non-tree plant questions. So there's a fun one tonight. So good to see you all. That's a good segue to Jeremy. Hi everyone, I'm Jeremy Wilson. I'm the, the director at the Harris Center. And I, I usually talk about some of the, the tree questions that arise. So the woody vegetation uh, rising tall. Okay, John Benjamin. Hi everybody, uh, my name is John Benjamin. I'm a teacher and naturalist at the Harris Center. And uh, at these events, I tend to answer questions in the field of the kingdom of fungi. Awesome. And then we have two guest stars tonight who are not um, our regulars here on Ask a Naturalist. Um, Mark Ellingwood, can you introduce yourself? Sure. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for the opportunity to join this. I've uh, attended once before, enjoy it very much. I'm a uh, certified wildlife biologist, recently retired with 41 years of uh, mainly mammal, but also some bird management and research experience. I look forward to answering your questions. And he's developing butterfly expertise too, which is awesome. Um, and Stephen, I think you are the last um, person to be introduced, another guest star for us tonight. Thank you, Brett. Uh, my name is Stephen Lamond. I'm an ecologist with Moosewood Ecological here in the Monadnock region. Uh, more of a wildlife ecologist with a particularly strong background in the bird world. So he'll be answering bird questions. Okay, here's our first one. Um, this is from John. Uh, so he sent this in in July. Um, who scratched up the down tree trunk? Porcupine, bear, curious about the world around me. So um, I'm not sure if this is a question for Mark or if this is a question for Stephen. Um, Which one of you would like to weigh in? I, I have an opinion, but I'm happy to defer to Stephen if that's his preference. Mark, why don't you start? Okay, uh, given the timing, um, it's quite possibly black bear foraging for grubs or ants in a rotting uh, tree limb. That's a very common food source for bears, particularly in the spring. And uh, I think less so as the summer progresses, but that, that would be my first guess. And uh, Stephen, the ball's in your court. Sure. So another potential option, although I think a mammal might be more responsible for this particular log, the other option that comes to my mind is the pileated woodpecker, our largest woodpecker here in North America. And they'll often be foraging on these fallen logs that are rich in insects, and their bill size allows them to tear off and knock off large chunks of wood, which we can see in this photo. Um, however, I don't quite see the distinct lines around the edge of that foraging activity on the log that's very characteristic of woodpecker foraging, which has me thinking it could be a mammal, but if it was a particularly sodden log, we can't necessarily rule out a pileated woodpecker. Thank you both. That's really interesting that, um... That mammal sign and bird sign can look so similar in appearance. Um, I'm glad we had you here, Mark, because we had some behind the scenes discussions and, and, and had landed on pileated. So it's great to know it might also be a black bear. 
All right, Miles, should we go to our next, our next um, question? This just came in the other day from Sarah. I was walking on the edge of the field at the end of Criff Road in Keene, just before the gate to the KSC athletic fields yesterday. There was a large bird in the field just kind of hanging out. Then it flew into a tree near me and let me stand under the tree and take photos, just kind of watching me. It's a hawk of some kind, but I don't know my hawks. Cooper's hawk, maybe? It kept bringing one leg up in front of its belly. Maybe it's injured. So Stephen, this one is, a, is firmly uh, in your court. Great question, Sarah. Cooper's hawk maybe is always a good guess because hawks are difficult to identify. However, there's one particular characteristic that I can see in this photo that tells me it's not a Cooper's hawk, and that is the dark brown belly band. It's more of a faint line on this bird. Thanks for pointing that out, Miles. And this tells me it's a red-tailed hawk. They're a common hawk of agricultural field edges. Um, other open areas in Criff Road is one of those spots where I would expect to see uh, a red-tailed hawk or a, another beautio. The other characteristic that stands out is in the written description is that the bird was hanging out in the field. That tells me it could have been hunting a mammal that was in the field, whereas a cooper hawk or another exhibitor, they hunt birds. They dash through the woods, maybe attack your bird feeder. And so because this bird was in the field, likely hunting in that area, and it has that brown belly band, I'm confident this is a red-tailed hawk. As for whether or not it's injured, um, it's probably not. Uh, hawks will raise one leg into their um, their belly feathers to regulate their body temperature. So if this was a particularly cold morning uh, or if the bird was uh, saving its energy for a later hunt, it can save some of that energy by tucking one leg into its feathers so that heat doesn't escape as readily. That's fascinating behavior. That's really helpful to know. Do other, other hawks in that um, family of hawks also do that? Absolutely. In fact, most birds, most perching birds, uh, can tuck their legs in one at a time. Um, and if on really cold nights, they'll tuck their bill backwards and tuck it under their wing. So it's this is just a chilly red-tailed hawk. Most likely. <laughs> Definitely red-tailed hawk. It's probably a little chilly. Awesome. So, so those of you who, um, who come to these Ask a Naturalist know that sometimes um, Mostly this is you asking questions of us and sometimes we ask questions of you. Um, and so we have a turn the tables and we're gonna show you a picture of two birds who are perched near one another. Um, and the question is, what is the difference between these two birds? And you can put your um, guesses in the chat. And Steven, we're gonna um, task you with determining who has answered this um, fully and completely and correctly first and they will win a Harris Center um, prize that we can send to them. So what's okay. the picture, Miles? And this is a picture from Hancock, New Hampshire. So what is the difference between these two birds? Stephen, do you see anyone that is... Um, yeah, I think everybody's gotten at least part of it right. I'm going to say that Pam Landry has the most correct answer. Um, so the female American kestrel is indeed on the left. We note that the wings lack that blue-gray band. And on the tail, there's only thin black bars. Whereas the male kestrel on the right, it looks slightly smaller. It has a dark, broad black band on the tail and that silver-blue-gray band on the wings. Excellent. So same species, different sexes. And um, what's the term for that? When they that is see them sexual sexually, dimorphism. Dimorphism. Sometimes we do vocabulary lessons here on Ask a Naturalist. So sexual dimorphism might be our first glossary term for the night. Um, wonderful. And these are, these are here's this um, another picture from earlier in the summer taken by our own Mead Caddo at the Harris Center from the same perch. Um, shows you, do you want to talk anything about the, the way these birds look different from the front, Stephen? Sure. So it's the same um, 
The female again is on the left and the male is on the right. It's a lot harder to judge the size from this photo, but if you look at the tail of the female sticking out below the bottom of the branch, we see that fine black barring on the female tail. And then on the male bird on the right, the head is more colorful. That's very characteristic of a male kestrel, whereas the back and side of the female head is much more light colored. And the male, there's also another interesting feature that isn't, isn't um, present on all male kestrels, but is present on this male kestrel. If you look at its foot, you can see that it is wearing a green bracelet. Um, this is a metal band that was um, affixed to this bird by biologists. We've, we've since learned, since this picture was taken, and since there's been a lot of um, Mead Caddo and Phil Brown have spent a lot of time watching these particular kestrels this summer and really getting some good looks at them and good looks at that band. Um, and so they've since learned that that band um, was put on that bird by biologists in New Jersey uh, this past spring. So probably during a migration stopover, um, this bird was, was captured and banded and then headed north to Hancock. And so it will be interesting to see if he returns uh, next year um, and where else he might be sighted along his travels. But that was a really exciting find. Bird banding is a really useful tool for learning things like um, where birds go and how long they live and lots of other um, information. And so we didn't band this bird, but we got to um, report that sighting. Okay, next one. All right, this is from Pam, September 27th, so just a couple days ago. Observe this lycopodium in a mixed forest adjacent to a large beaver pond in Barrie, Massachusetts. Any thoughts on the reason for or cause of the vegetative growth above? Oh man, Karen Seaver, you might have to help me say this word. The stroboli? Is that stroboli. Yep. Stroboli. So, can, so you're going to have to um, explain yep. that term too as sure. part of our vocabulary lesson. Absolutely. Um, but what can you share with Pam and the rest of us? Yeah. Well, first, yeah, shout out to Pam for throwing in this word. You, I knew as soon as I read this that Pam knows about plants if she's thrown about stroboli. So stroboli is the plural form of strobilus, which is um, the, the, the yellowish structures that we see here. Um, and, the, and what they are doing, they're holding spores. So... This is a plant that's is in this group of plants is called Lycopodium, and it's a weird it, it it's such a strange where it sounds like if someone says Lycopodium, what I looked up what that word means. It actually means wolf's foot. So I don't know. Someone thought they and there's a whole group of them. You might have heard these referred to as club mosses, which is a group of plants. Um, and it's a bit of a misnomer because these are not mosses. And how do we know? Well, these are vascularized plants, which means they have enclosed vessel elements, which mo mosses do not. So they're not a moss. And sometimes these are also called princess pines or fairy pines. And that's also a misnomer because this is not a baby tree. It is is doesn't have lignin or other woody like tissues. Um, so <clears throat> this plant grows in wet forest floor areas and you know doesn't ever get very big. What's going on here with the green above the yellow is you've had this is this is uncommon. I haven't seen this too much either Pam. So they usually kind of end with the yellow tips. Um, Something's going on here where the vegetative growth is continuing. It's probably just something that some of them do where the, the vegetative growth takes over. Eventually what will happen is the central section the, where the spores are being stored will dry out um, and then turn brown. So if you see these, you know, kind of in the winter time, the stroboli that are bright yellow here uh, will turn kind of brown or orangish. So, I'm not sure why it's doing that. It's just sort of one of you know nature's variations and plants uh, are very different in, than animals in that they have so many zones of differentiation where the plant cells can differentiate and become different tissues. 
it's a lot akin to stem cells, if you will. It has some similarities to that. So plants have a lot of variation and ability to sort of, you know, grow different tissues in different places, much more so than animals. One fun fact about Lycopodium is their spores are flammable. You can light them on fire and they explode. So uh, in the past, music uh, musicians, magicians have used them as a bit of the pizzazz, right? And also native folks use these in uh, ceremonial applications and even Old school flash photography use like a podium powder to uh, have a flash to sort of light up the background. So I did do a little bit of searching on that. And if you really want to do this, you could collect like a podium and try it. They also sell it at Carolina Biological Supply. So hopefully we're not, def you know, going out and harvesting too many like podiums for those I don't know, carnival purposes. <laughs> so there's what I know about this plant. That's fascinating. I had no idea. It seems like we need a, I don't know, some sort of like bonfire, like a podium fireworks event at the Harris Center. Um, there was a question from Peggy wondering about size, how big these are, because it's hard to tell scale and they do kind of look like conifers. You're muted, Karen, can you unmute? Six inches max, I would say closer to four, you know, won't get much bigger than that. So uh, forest floor dwellers, and there's a whole world of club mosses out there. It's a really cool group of plants um, that come in all kind of different growth forms. So a fun group of plants to get into if you uh, like kind of looking down in the forest rather than looking up all the time. Awesome. Thanks, Karen. And thanks for the observation, Pam. All right, up next, KW, this is back from May. I saw this colony of mushrooms on a down tree trunk in my neighborhood. I was amazed how much they looked like clams. Can you identify the species and possibly some cool factoids about them? P.S. you're all awesome, thanks. Well, thank you, KW. And um, Susie's not here to say it, so I will say it. John Benjamin, our resident fun guy, um, this question is for you. All right, thank you, Brett, and thank you, KW, for the photo there. Uh, yeah, I can identify this species. This is a pretty common species, uh, a type that you can find year-round in our woods, and this is uh, commonly referred to as false turkey tail, uh, Sterium austria, uh, the scientific name, and uh, as the name suggests, this is one of the many species that many people will mistake for a true turkey tail, which is another common local species that kind of superficially looks very much like this, little shelfy looking mushrooms with stripes on them growing from dead wood on the ground. And there's quite a host of different species that kind of look like that. And I often, when I'm taking um, people out for mushroom hikes, I always remind them, you've got to look under the surface of the cap. That's the first step in differentiating between some of the basic families of mushrooms, uh, the major uh, you know, uh, divisions of mushrooms. And true turkey tail if you turn it over it has a sort of creamy white surface and if you look carefully it has tiny little holes which are the pores so hence it's a polypore and that's where the spores are produced all mushrooms are essentially spore uh, distribution uh, structures um, and in this case the false turkey tail if you turn it over it doesn't really have a true spore surface in the sense of gills or pores it kind of just has a sort of smooth browner surface might kind of look similar to the top to be honest kind of parchment like and thin and technically speaking this is kind of a, a crust fungus not a polypore um, sometimes they just form sort of uh, smooth crusts over the surface of dead wood um, in this case uh, this is a specialist on the bark of trees both dead wood and sometimes it can be pathogenic and uh, the mycelium can grow in the bark of living trees and kind of sometimes cause some damage doing that. Um, any other cool facts about these? Uh, colony, that sounds good as a congregational term for mushrooms. I don't know if there's a really good uh, uh, fun term like they have for some other animals. You can call it clusters when they're close together, like we'll have another uh, photo coming up of mushrooms. But in this case, I don't know, what do you, want, you want to call it a bed of mushrooms because they look like clams? That sounds good to me. I like that, a bed of, mush a bed of clam like mushrooms. All right, awesome. Thanks, John. All Before right. I weigh in on this, can I ask John a quick question? Go for it. So John, you were saying the, the way to tell the difference is on the underside. So how mm -hmm. could you tell the difference from that photo? 
you know, I just have become kind of familiar with some of the the types of striping and the appearance and kind of that clam like actually appearance. True turkey tail won't do that. It doesn't really branch out from a sort of tapered point like that as often. And you just kind of develop an eye for it. You know, a lot of these mushroom species can be quite variable. I mean, even uh, true turkey tail is called Tremedes versicolor in its scientific name, which means it has lots of color variations in the striping and the appearance can be quite different. But it's those those uh, important features underneath the cap that you got to hone in on to really become uh, uh, sure about it, but I could just kind of tell by the appearance on the top. Because you're a fun guy. Gotcha. Exactly. Thank yeah. you. Okay, our next one is a super adorable observation from Tony. Um, Tony says, I planted a spice bush this summer and for the last few weeks have noticed that something has been eating its leaves. On Labor Day weekend, I checked it out again and when I looked down, I saw these great big eyes looking right back at me. Many of us attended the butterfly class last spring. Shout out to Mark Ellingwood for that. Um, and I wonder if anyone can identify this adorable caterpillar. I'm also wondering whether this caterpillar will have time to make its chrysalis and finish its life cycle this year, or will it overwinter? I'm excited to look for the chrysalis in the next few weeks. Jenna. This one seems like a question for All you. All right, I might refer, I might um, defer to Mark on some of these, but this is one of, I've never seen one of these out in the world. I've only seen it in captivity, but this is a spice bush swallowtail larva. And those giant eye spots are one of its defensive mechanisms. And it has that defensive mechanism um, in every stage of its life, in addition to this other fabulous defense mechanism, which is called an osmaterium. We can add that to our vocabulary list for today. Um, and if the, the larva is threatened, it has this little gland that it pushes out kind of from um, night. I don't even know quite how to explain where on that. You can um, write, Miles, if you can put your cursor kind of right beneath the eye spots, right down there, is where these little glands will come out and they were, um, they mimic a snake's tongue. That's what it looks like to me. Um, and they also emit a foul odor. So, um, and I, I, I have read this and I've seen it in the black swallowtail larva as well. They also have osmaterium or osmateria is probably plural, but Mark, you might know if all the papilio species have this feature or if it's just some of them. Um, so you might chime in there if you know that one. Oh, you're muted, though. You got to unmute. There you yeah, go. thank you for that, Jenna. I uh, I do not know if that is common characteristic across the entire uh, genera or um, class. Uh, I do want to mention that I uh, I did encounter a spice bush butterfly this year, only one, and it was on Miles' property, enjoying some of those beautiful lilies that he has on his property. So that was an <laughs> exciting find, and I, I consider this caterpillar to be an equally exciting find. I do too, and uh, I see Tony just wrote in the chat um, that um, they feed at night and sort of curl up in silk during the day. That is absolutely true. Um, another thing that's interesting about these is that during the earlier instars, which are the earlier stages of the caterpillar, they won't be this bright green. They'll be a brownish color um, and they mimic uh, bird droppings. So that's another type of um, defense mechanism is that they're going to just try and mimic bird poop because who wants to eat bird poop? So they, uh, and they do have the eye spots during that stage and they also have the osmaterium during that stage. They have a lot of different ways that they're trying to protect themselves from being eaten. Um, and one of the things that Tony asks is about the life cycle. These actually spend the winter as a pupa in the leaf litter. So this insect will crawl down into the leaf litter, maybe under a log and turn into a pupa and then spend the winter that way and emerge in the spring as a butterfly. So that is, um, that is its adaptation for coping with our New Hampshire winters. You wanna add anything, Mark, about this amazingly cute little larva? Thank you, Jen. I think you did an excellent job. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for sharing that, Tony. It's a really exciting find and just really cool to see it. Okay, we're moving back into fungi. Um, orange mushrooms, what are they? Why do they have that color? This is from August and I, we don't have a location here. So maybe, I don't know if that's important information that you need, John, or if you can just tell. 
I'm looking. All right. Well, uh, thank you. And um, for this uh, photograph from our anonymous photographer. And uh, so the first thing I would mention is that if you do find mushrooms that you're interested in photographing and maybe sending in to ask a naturalist to help with identification, it's super helpful to get a little bit closer and ideally to even have a picture of one of the mushrooms flipped so you can see the underside. Does it have gills? Does it have pores? Uh, you know, other structures? Those are just uh, some really valuable details. And sometimes I get photos where it's just in, a, in the distance and I really can't tell. It's just a brown mushroom and that's all I can say about it. In this case, there are some pretty distinct feature so I do have a pretty strong idea of the species a pretty pretty good guess and my guess is that this is what's sometimes called the jack-o-lantern mushroom Ompelotus illudens and what made me think that is the super bright orange color and that clustering in this case and these little bits around um, the roots of this tree that species tends to grow from uh, you know rotting wood in the ground or sometimes it can also be a bit pathogenic on the root systems of trees and they, they have these dense clusters that uh, become these big kind of beautiful gilled mushrooms uh, with that bright orange color and uh, some interesting facts about this one is it is a toxic mushroom it won't kill you but it can wreak some gastronomical havoc on you for a few days and definitely not one you want to make the mistake of eating um, and another uh, thing about it that's kind of famous is it is uh, rather weakly bioluminescent. It's not quite as impressive as maybe you might think with, you know, that he's a fox fire. I, I have taken samples and sometimes it's pretty hard to see. I've even heard people on the internet claim it's a hoax and they don't actually glow. But I, I can claim I have seen it very faintly if your eyes are really just in the dark. So the gills have this very faint green glow and some other fungi species uh, glow even brighter than this. And so a question they had was, well, why does it have the color orange? Well, why, the reason it's orange is a little dip, more difficult to answer. I mean, there's kind of a bit of a mystery why so many mushrooms have these crazy colors and appearances when really they're just ephemeral spore dispersal structures. And do they want animals to, you know, uh, eat them? Are they trying to warn animals that they're poisonous? You know, maybe uh, there's, there's a lot of debate about that. But as far as the, um, the bioluminescent gills, the theory is that it actually does attract nocturnal insects and then they pick up spores on their bodies and then help to disperse them in the environment. So... That's what I have to say about the spooky jack-o'-lantern mushroom. And there's a question from Stephen in the chat. Uh, is mushroom associated with red oaks as it appears to be in this photo? Yeah, you know, Stephen, I, I don't quite know. I don't believe it's a specialist. I think it's a little bit more of a generalist. It does seem like a lot of um, mushrooms that kind of uh, are what we call butt rot mushrooms that focus on sort of pathogenically invading the root systems tend to go for red oaks, like, um, you know, things like um, uh, honey mushrooms and um, hen of the woods. So I kind of wonder um, if maybe there is some susceptibility red oaks have, but I don't think it's a specialist on red oaks. I'd have to uh, do some research to verify that, but that's my thought. And for the, I have a question. So this is an August photo um, and jack-o'-lantern makes me think of October and Halloween. Are they likely to be fruiting like this into the fall or only you know, in the summer? Um, the, I, I've tended to find these towards the end of summer and into the fall. And really, you know, the sort of uh, durations uh, of a lot of these mushrooms is very much weather dependent and, you know, how long we have warm weather, if we get some more rains or not, or if we dry out again. And that will really determine how late a lot of these species might be appearing. They don't quite have the, the as regular seasonal cycles as a lot of other uh, plants and other organisms have. So you kind of have to look at the weather for how long they might persist. But they, they can certainly stick around for a while, to Halloween even maybe. <laughs> Did John ask folks to send him mushroom photos? As Tony Tony thinks that maybe we've we've he's he's like uh, intentionally seeding this with lots of fungi pictures. Oh, we've got a poll. Okay, now we're turning this back around to you guys. We've moved on from fungi for at least a moment, and we may return to it. Um, we are going to share a picture that was actually taken about, I think, two days ago. And do you have the picture, Miles? So this picture was taken um, just a couple days ago, late September here. What is this snake doing? And I think there are options for you to choose from when Miles pulls the pole up. So what is this snake doing? Coiling up to strike, heading underground for hibernation, basking on the road, <laughs> counting, adding up four and four correctly, laying eggs that look like rocks. <laughs> um, all right, the clear winners, uh, people, thought that the snake was basking on the road. 
Um, and yes, although I, I will say, um, yes, that is the, the primary thing I think that the snake was doing. This time of year, there are a lot of snakes on roads. Um, they're, they're really trying to soak up late season heat um, and get warmth where they can find it, which um, often is on pavement, or in this case, this was a dirt road. Um, there's a few other interesting things that were in that choice. They're coiling up to strike. I wouldn't say this snake was coiling up to strike, but as the person who moved this snake off the road, I can tell you um, that it was getting a bit bitey and it was, it was perceiving me as a predator. And this particular um, snake has a reputation for that. This is a juvenile Northern water snake and they, um, they're feisty. And so it, it, um, it was getting ready to launch itself at me a little bit because it did not like that I was so close to it. Um, so you could have answered coiling up to strike and you wouldn't have been, have been wrong. Basking is also right. But John, do you want to say anything else about snakes this time of year? Um, nothing too much. I think you covered it. I think the snake looks like it's in a defensive posture and they are, they are, you're probably going to get bit by a Northern water snake when you go to pick it up. If it's doing this, even if it's a small guy, they're, they're uh, not afraid of you. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, it's, it, some snakes are kind of, as we start to get cold snaps, they're getting ready to kind of start finding their hibernation sites, which means they have to get out of frost, uh, air, you know, uh, prone areas deeper into the ground. They call them hibernacula. A lot of snakes kind of have some group uh, gatherings, the hibernacula, just because they're the choice sites to hibernate in. So you do have kind of a mini migration with some kinds of snakes to these same sites they come to uh, every year in the fall to uh, prepare to hibernate down in the earth. I have a question for you, John, about this snake. I saw, I found this snake and another juvenile water snake about 15 feet down the road. They were both on the same road. Do they, I was surprised I don't usually see snakes together like that on a road. Do they, would, might they have been hanging out together before <laughs> yeah, heading they, to their hibernacula? Or is it just buds, coincidental? Uh, Generally speaking, when snakes are found together, it's because it's just a good place to be and they're just sharing that habitat, kind of like when turtles are all sharing a log basking, you know. I mean, not that, not that reptiles don't have social behaviors and more complex interactions that we're still learning about, but generally speaking, they're probably just both hanging out on a nice sunny road that's a good place to be. And Pat's asking about um, reactions to their bites. I should clarify, they're not, um, they're not venomous. New Hampshire, there's only one venomous snake species and it's exceptionally rare. Um, I've never seen one in the wild and most people haven't. Um, that's the timber rattlesnake. It occurs in very few locations because of a long history of persecution by humans. Um, so this, the Northern water snake is not venomous. Um, they, I've never actually been bitten by one. Have any, John or Mark, have you yeah. had that experience? You wanna share what that feels like? I mean, it, most of our non-venomous snakes, they bite you, and if you wash it off, you might have a little bit of, of swelling, but probably not too bad. Uh, that said, many non-venomous snakes have been found to have some kind of complex enzymes in their saliva and actually kind of act effectively as venom as they're chewing into their prey. So if you don't wash it or you really let it chew into you, you might have a little more of a reaction. I don't quite know about northern water snakes, but I know uh, certainly common garter snakes have been studied and found to have some interesting things in their saliva that are you know kind of is like weak venom. So... But it hasn't been too bad when I've been bit by these. You wash it off, you're fine. Okay. Is there any, Mark, did you have something? You look like you might have wanted to add something. Did you have something to to add on the snake front? Um, other than as a child, I recall being bitten by a water snake. Uh, it wasn't a dramatic event. And I, I'm kind of proud of my wife, who is a hero for large water snakes, having fished them out among swimmers on Norway Pond many, many times. So uh, it's a wonderful snake that deserves our respect and uh, protection. And it's, uh, it's something that I think we should all embrace as an essential part of our landscape. 100%. Um, and one thing I will mention, I did move the, those snakes off the road. I used a, a stick to kind of gently pick them up and that was plenty fine. It might not have worked for a large water snake, but if you're someone who's nervous about touching a snake or getting potential for getting bitten, um, you can find a, a stick on the side of the road and, and use that to not have to touch that animal, but still move it to safety because snakes get hit by cars all the time. And um, it's a better world when they're alive and not dead on the road, so. 
Okay, our next question is a really exciting one. Sorry, this is sent in to us uh, by our own Phil Brown. Sorry, he's not here to present it, um, but it's really cool. Uh, so what's that bear doing sleeping in that cherry tree? Phil said, I encountered this young Bruin this morning at the Dublin Rotary Park off Route 101 as I was walking to check on the drawn down impoundment, um, how reservoir, where Eric Masterson tipped me off to 10 species of shore shorebirds that were foraging on the mudflats there, including white rumped sandpipers. This is like such an aside for a birder. It's very classic birder, birder here. Um, anyway, because we're talking about bears, but there's also the aside about shorebirds at Hare Reservoir. So at first the bear was simply snoozing, but as I approached its ears <clears> perked up, I was able to walk under it without disturbing it too much. And when I walked back about an hour later, it was still in the tree, but was more active. So cool to finally see a bear in a bear tree. So Mark, what, what can you share about this bear? Um, thank you for that. another picture through, yeah. I think this one was probably through his uh, spotting scope that he was bringing out to look at the birds. I hope it was through the spotting scope. Yeah, beautiful photographs. As you likely know, we have something on the order of 5,000 bears in the state of New Hampshire. They're present in every town in the state. Interesting anecdote whenever I um, see a black bear in a tree is to consider the selective influences of the presence of trees on black bears versus grizzly bears. The fact that black bears can readily seek refuge in trees uh, preempts their need to be both large and aggressive as compared to some of the Western species that lack that ability, lack that opportunity, and as a consequence have different attributes to protect themselves. Um, that said, black bears are commonly found in trees. Uh, trees are climbed primarily for refuge and or for food. The fact that Phil references this bear as a small bear um, give some insight into the possibility that as a young bear um, dispersing at something on the order of 20 months or so, um, life is pretty perilous. These young bears are subject to, uh, to harassment and uh, physical um, encounters with adult bears that would prefer they didn't set up their ranges in those areas and as a consequence frequently find themselves in trees. This is particularly true for young males which disperse away from the maternal range. Females adopt range in close association with the sow. Um, in this particular case this appears to be a black cherry and a Jeremy uh, or anyone else could correct me if, if I'm wrong in that regard but if in fact that's the case then black bears and black cherries is uh, very common because black cherries are on the list of preferred mast species or fruit and nut species that bears prefer. Particularly important during the fall when bears go into a stage called hyperphagia or hyperfood consumption, where they might be consuming upwards of 20,000 calories a day and adding up to two pounds a day in preparation for a estivation, if you will, that they have to survive during the winter months. Um, interesting anecdote, uh, New Hampshire Fish and Game has for over 20 years tracked annual mast production on 10 or so species. Oak is the primary species of interest south of the White Mountains. Beach is the primary species of interest for bears north of the White Mountains, but black cherry and pin cherry are, are high on that list and uh, highly preferred, particularly when um, oak and beech is scarce. The other thing I just mentioned quickly is that food drives most bear behavior. Bad food years results in bears being highly visible in human environments, uh, be they cornfields or bird feeders in the backyards of homes and even chickens. So uh, bear behavior is, is directly driven by the uh, relative abundance of natural foods. And I'll stop there and entertain any additional questions. Is there, is there any questions that people wanna put in the chat about black bear behavior, especially this time of year? I think it's amazing to have looked up and seen a bear in a tree like that so close. What an amazing experience for Phil. 
there's definitely been a, a spat of bear encounters here in Hancock. Does it seem like a, a low food year? Does it, it seem like they're struggling this year, Mark? Do you know? Yeah, I would say uh, the acorn crop is poor this year. Beech nuts seem pretty scarce as well. And even in midsummer, soft foods such as raspberries and blackberries were, were average at best. And so I'd say, yes, we're going to see a lot of black bears. Uh, corn farmers uh, are going to experience substantial damage in their fields as a consequence. So far, that's what it looks like, Miles. Okay, our next question is from John. He sent this in in mid-August. He says, can you or your group identify the, this bird nest and eggs? The bird built a nest in the front door reef. I would walk by and a bird would fly away, but I couldn't tell where. No nest in the bushes and no swallow nest on the house walls. My wife discovered the nest in the reef. The birds had abandoned the nest due to my interruptions, which is sad. Stephen, um, and you can see those of you, there's arrows um, pointing to the location of the nest and a close up on the eggs, which might help with identification. Yeah, so I don't know 100% for sure which bird species this is. Um, the eggs look fairly small relative to the flower size. Um, and given that the nest location is in a wreath, my immediate thought is to go to the classic wreath nesting birds of New England, the wrens. So we have the house wren and the Carolina wren frequently nesting on properties very close to homes and houses. And I've seen a number of Carolina and house wren nests in wreaths uh, sitting on active doorways or nearby. Um, the eggs to me look a little bit more like Carolina wrens than house wrens, but it's hard to know for sure. They both build fairly sticky nests. Um, if I had, if there was a written note about the habitat, um, Carolina wrens are more urban, suburban. Um, house wrens tend to be a little more uh, closer to the woods, but there is some overlap. So that could give us another clue which wren species this might be. Um, but those are my best two guesses uh, for this bird nest. Do you, can you wager a guess? So after they abandon that nest, um, were they likely to try again somewhere with less disturbance? Or is good, it impossible to say? Good question. It depends on the time of year. I note that the question was sent in on August 17th, but that doesn't mean the photo was taken on August 17th. That would be a particularly late nesting date for a wren species. Um, but if it's early enough in the nesting season, certainly uh, these birds would have moved elsewhere and successfully raised young. Um, typically wrens will have two broods here in southern New Hampshire uh, during the breeding season. Further south they might even raise three clutches in a single breeding season, which is a lot of work for the parents. Rancy wants to know if she puts up a wreath, will she have a greater chance of attracting a wren to her yard? Absolutely. Uh, any small addition of potential nesting habitat uh, for wrens or other birds certainly boosts your odds uh, of, of having wrens and other birds come closer to your home. Um, I also see Cynthia's question, could the owner have moved the wreath? Possibly. Um, there's there's mixed success in birds uh, ad adopting a nest that has been moved um, from one location to another. Oh, and one more question that just came in. Pat said, did people passing by really dissuade the birds from using the nest? I know some friends who have robins building a nest in a vine next to their door and they're not bothered by people coming and going. Great question, Pat. So robins are very tolerant of human activity. Um, and it sounds like, well, from my experience, most robins will nest adjacent to a doorway or above a doorway, not necessarily on the door like this this wren nest may have been. And so that would have experienced more movement uh, from humans going in and out of that door. And so yes, a lot of bird species are very tolerant to human activity. Um, a lot of birds will benefit from a human presence uh, that discourages predators from coming closer to the nest. So big list of pros and cons for, for birds building nests very close to human activity. Okay, our next one. This scat was left on the threshold of our door. 
who could have gifted us such a present? This is from David and Alstead in July. And I think Miles has some experience with this particular scat. What do you yeah. say, Miles? I mean, I'm no princess of poop. Um, <laughs> I, I don't I don't see a whole lot of poop in my in my day to day, but I do see a lot of this poop. Uh, the the toads, I, they're just all around my house and I have these patios and they are amazing poopers. Um, usually I can see uh, insect parts or ant parts, but you know, they start out in the spring pretty small. And as these toads grow and grow through the summer, they get bigger and bigger. This time of year, it's incredible. Um, I don't know, <laughs> you can go down quite the rabbit hole of, uh, of YouTube videos if you want to look this up. But uh, the actual videos of the event happening is pretty amazing. It looks like half the body weight of the toad is coming out. It, uh, it's pretty amazing. So I've seen these around my house. In fact, I just went out before this, uh, before the, the sh this program and, and picked <laughs> one up. Uh, the main one that I had uh, was run over by the lawnmower and is not around anymore. But this one, I can really see the insect parts. I think earlier in the spring, they did seem a little wetter than they are now. But uh, yeah, this is a, definitely a, a toad scat. Pam just messaged me and said, you're the new Prince of Poop. You're, you're, you're holding the title with Susie there, but that's amazing. Toads are really voracious eaters. Um, they, they eat all kinds of invertebrates, insects, as well as, well as the worms and other invertebrates. And so um, July is prime time for them to fatten up and, and forage. Um, I meant to look up, there's a statistic for how much they eat um, their body weight. I bet I can find it maybe when we go um, to the next question, I can pop back in with it because it was a very impressive statistic about um, how much they eat. So I'll, maybe we can come um, come back to that. All right, next question is a bird feeder question from Lisa submitted this month. Um, she is showing um, a bunch of birds at her feeder. I think they are goldfinches, but you'll have to answer that, Stephen. She's saying, are they all female? We often get 12 at a time between the two feeders. Are these migrating birds? I haven't seen so many at one time all summer and the males seem absent. So what's going on here, Stephen? Yeah, great question, Lisa. So these are indeed American goldfinches. They're small finches, very common uh, at bird feeders throughout New Hampshire and New England. Um, this time of year, the males and females look virtually identical. So they'll go through their fall molt uh, starting in early August and typically ending uh, right around now in the end of September. Uh, so I note that this photo was taken in September. So the males would have lost all, if not most of, uh, their their bright yellow colors as they get ready for the fall. During the winter, um, birds need a fresh set of feathers to keep them warm, and they also don't need to attract females during the winter. They'll save that for the breeding season. And so why have all those bright feathers when you're more likely to attract predators? Uh, so it's a two for one by molting their feathers in the fall. They get fresh feathers to help them survive the winter and uh, a little more of a dull plumage so they can better survive predation. Um, as for whether or not they're migrating, uh, this is a migratory species and we are in fall migration. So it's possible that some of the American goldfinches in this photo here came from a little bit farther north. Excellent. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, do you want to wait? Do you want to, do you or Mark want to say anything about bird feeders this time of year? For folks who are interested in feeding birds, um, that any best practices you want to offer? Well, I'll turn it over to Mark in a second. We just talked about black bears and their hyperphagia, their mass eating as they're putting on weight uh, to get ready for, for their winter sleep. And uh, yes, they will often frequent bird feeders this time of year. So Mark, do you have any recommendations for what bird feeders can do during the fall? Well, I, you know, I don't want to rain on anybody's bird feeding parade, but uh, from my perspective, as somebody who is responsible for black bear management in the state, I just encourage people to be aware that if you do have bears in the community, um, you know, try not to feed them bad habits, essentially. Uh, black, black sunflower seeds 
in comparison to beech nuts, acorns, and other uh, native foods are remarkably nutritious. And so when you see the specs on the calories and fat content of these respective foods and black sunflower seeds are on that list, you quickly come to understand why bears are going to that refrigerator rather than nature's refrigerator to fill that need. So you know, please be cognizant that what you enjoy relative to bear sightings may be a problem for some of your neighbors and try to strike that balance. If you have bears actively in your community, I would discourage you from feeding until those bears have moved on. Thanks, Mark. All right, I think this might be our last question of the night, which is great timing. I submitted this one on behalf of Karen Siever and I. Um, we were out looking under cover boards, little wooden boards that we put out to help survey for salamanders. So we were looking under those cover boards for salamanders earlier this week, and we discovered this large wasp um, with the acorn cap for scale in there in a circular excavation. What is it and what is it doing? So let's look so apparently at Apparently my little dog wanted to help answer this one. <laughs> Here she is. Um, this is a bald face hornet female. Um, she's a queen. The reason I know this is because um, this, most of our social insects um, in this region, not all, but most, the female is only, is going to be the only one that overwinters. And this one overwinters as an adult, like most wasp species do. Um, and what happens is they go out and they mate in the late fall. And then she um, will go and overwinter. The males will all die. And um, she will overwinter and hold all of that sperm inside her body until the spring. And then she will come out as um, basically a brand new queen. So she she is, I guess we could call her a queen now, even though she hasn't had any um, offspring yet. So she's she's find, found this great place to spend the winter. And um, Brett said when she sent this to me um, yesterday, I think it was when you found it or two days ago, that, um, that you know, lady in waiting, exactly that she was really docile like she didn't really she wasn't too bothered by you guys looking at her and then you covered her back up um and i actually with kids i've uncovered um bald faced hornet females in the springtime before they emerge from the ground and they're even more still than this you can only tell they're alive by just the barely just tiny little movements of the abdomen so um yeah it's pretty amazing that you can see her breathing through, uh, they breathe through tiny holes called spiracles in their abdomen and thorax, and you can see her breathing, which I love. Um, so good find, you guys. And so she created that circular. You know, I'm not yeah. sure. It almost looks to me like the ac was the acorn not there. No, I put the acorn there because I wanted something for scale. Yeah, so. I've never seen. I've never seen them at this stage of the fall. I've only ever found them in the spring when the ground is all mushier around them. So I don't know if they actually like create that. Or not? Yep, yeah, uh, Pat. Yes, they overwinter um, either underground or in a rotten log. They're basically looking for the right set of conditions, and I guess they this particular female found the right set of conditions under under one of our cover boards. Um, when I've found them before, they've been maybe an inch or two down into the soil. I found one once um, in a very um, rotten log, very soft log underneath the bark. Um, so they're looking for the right amount of humidity. They're looking for the right um, protection from the temperature. And then when the snow falls, they're nicely protected from the super cold snaps that we get with that blanket of snow on top of them. Well, we'll Good be find. checking these boards a couple more times this fall for salamanders. So we'll be able to see what this lady is doing then too. So, well, we're, we've reached our, our time here. It's um, 6.30. So We've at the end of our questions for tonight, but we just want to thank all of you for sending in your great questions. This is so much fun for us to look through them all and to think about um, all these different species um, and phenomena that we're encountering out there. Um, and I want to thank our naturalists and our especially our guest star naturalists, um, Mark and Stephen, as well as um, Karen and John and Miles and Jenna and Jeremy. So. Um, thanks, everyone. And um, we don't have a date yet for the winter Ask a Naturalist, but it will be coming in the new year. So look for it. All right. Bye. Thanks, all. Till next time. <laughs>